this is the beginning of the urinary system. First, let's list a few of the functions of the urinary system. The kidneys are the main organ, and they excrete nitrogenous wastes. And those include creatinine, uric acid, and urea. And these are all nitrogen-containing compounds that are byproducts of metabolism. The kidneys are a key organ for water balance. And regulating and maintaining blood volume. For example, um, they secrete the hormone EPO and renin, if you'll recall. Um, and EPO is going to increase erythrocytes, renin is going to cause the formation of angiotensin II so that you can increase blood pressure as needed. electrolyte balance and that's to make sure um, that you have appropriate levels of salt, calcium, potassium, etc. And interestingly another function we can add on here is uh, modifying drugs or deactivating medications. So when you're in an allied health program it might be important to recognize that how often you need to give a medication is going to depend on um, both the liver, which we've talked about as modifying and deactivating medications, and also how much the kidneys alter a medication and then basically break it down or excrete it so that you need to give another dosage. Okay, now let's use a different color pen, and I'm going to tell you a few other key ideas about the kidneys. You can kind of list these as four primary functions. Uh, and, and to do, to accomplish these things, the kidneys filter the blood and produce urine. So the wastes end up in the urine and then the appropriate balance of fluid and salts, etc., goes back in the blood. The pH of urine is about 6, and this is acidic, right? So that has a key role in inhibiting pathogens from growing in the urethra, since the urine is flushing through there um, several times a day. And so then you if you're not urinating very frequently, you're not having that flush of acidic urine come through and pathogens are more likely to grow. Uh, if the pH is um, too high, like maybe it's 7 or 8, this may be a clue as to if the patient has oops, a UTI, a urinary tract infection. And then which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Was the urine too alkaline and so pathogens could grow? Or if pathogens begin growing in the urinary tract infection, they actually secrete products that make the pH more basic. So it can also be a negative cycle where UTI causes the urine to become more and more alkaline, or relatively more. Okay, so that's one um, key idea is this this acidic nature of urine. And then another key idea we're going to come back to numerous times in this unit is that blood cells, so white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, and protein such as albumin, fibrinogen, angio angiotensinogen, etc., uh, hormones, for example, these things should never 
be filtered. So they stay in the blood. They do not enter the tube system of the filtering apparatus of the kidneys. And if you are finding blood cells or protein in the urine, meaning that they were being filtered, that is a sign of kidney damage. So you can see, you get clues. So if they are, then if this is a clue to kidney damage or infection. The filtering apparatus has been damaged and now stuff is getting through that shouldn't. Okay, now another key idea we'll come back to over and over again, glucose should never be in the urine. Notice I didn't say that it isn't filtered because it is, but even, even though it's filtered, it's reabsorbed. So we'll put it completely reabsorbed back into the blood from the filtering apparatus. And if it there is, so then this is a clue that blood sugar is too high. And if blood sugar is too high, then the kidneys are unable to reabsorb it all. So that's why it might be indicative of diabetes. Okay, so that's our um, little bit of background. Some take home ideas that we'll come back to over and over again about what should never be filtered, what should be completely reabsorbed, and the purpose of the acidic urine, and then um, the four primary jobs of the kidneys, okay? All right, now this first page, um, we're going to label the different blood vessels that send blood to the filtering apparatus. So we've been talking on and on about how the kidneys are filtering blood. Well, what they have to do is go from big abdominal aorta, right, all the way down to little tiny capillaries, and then the capillaries go to the filtering apparatus. I'm going to take you through that right now. So first, got the abdominal, actually put, put label this up here, abdominal aorta. So that's the pink one. We're going to color code all of these. And then blood goes from the abdominal aorta to the renal artery. Okay, and now it's going to segment into five smaller arteries. So a great name for those are the segmental arteries. And a kidney <clears throat> may have somewhere around five of these. And then next, it's going to go between the lobes of the kidneys. So there's typically about five to eight lobes in a kidney. And so each of those lobes has an artery that goes on either side of that lobe. So each segmental artery splits into two interlobar arteries. So you'd have about 10 of them. And notice every time it splits, the blood vessels would be getting smaller. I guess my picture doesn't really show that, but they would be. Now here is my warning. For those of you that like looking up a lot of different sources um, and textbooks, you will very likely find some additional 
uh, blood vessel divisions and some other blood vessel names and I really don't want you to worry about that. If you like learning those, fine, but I'm going to test on a pretty basic um, progression of blood vessels because it's not so important to me that you remember for the rest of your life that these are interlobar arteries. What I really want you to understand is that the blood has to get to the filtering apparatus. That's what we're looking at right here, okay? So I try to, as usual, keep it simple. Okay, then each of those interlobar arteries actually arcs around the top of each lobe. And so that, it's like the blood joins back up again together. This oxygenated blood carrying wastes and many other things out toward the filtering apparatus. So we call that, the arc, we call those the arcuate arteries. And they're named that because they arch or arc over the top of each lobe. And now the blood vessels are getting very, very tiny, hard to see. Off the top of each lobe, there are some arteries that go straight out, kind of like the spokes on a wheel. They radiate out toward outside of the kidney because they radiate out in the cortex of the kidney. We call them cortical radiate arteries. Okay, and now we're to the microscopic level, which you can't see on the kidney. Like if you were to section a kidney, you actually could see many of these blood vessels, but after this you can't, they're too tiny. So now the cortical radiate arteries go to tiny arterioles. And when you hear that word arterial, right away you should think, ah, blood pressure regulation. And yes, they are going to be key for regulating the blood pressure systemically. So during fight or flight, these will constrict. And that will reduce blood flow and filtering in the kidney and systemically it will raise blood pressure so that's why it would be a good, good thing. So basically the body is saying and the kidney is playing its part to say alright um, we don't need to be filtering blood and making urine in the next hour because we're just trying to stay alive. And then, oops, then the afferent arterial, we're going to go like this now. Goes to the glomerulus. And this is the site of filtration. Um, this is a, the, what we call it the glomerular capillary bed the site of filtration, and then um, blood that isn't filtered at that point, so all the blood cells, will then continue to what's called the efferent arterial. And the efferent arterial receives reabsorbed substances like glucose. And then, oops, sorry, I meant to say the cross that off. I'm getting ahead of myself. Then the efferent arterial goes to 
another capillary bed called the paratubular capillary bed. And then there's a return, actually put blue after that, to um, cortical radiate venules. And it goes right back the other way. So then there's going to be a cortical radiate vein, an arcuate vein, an interlobar vein segmental veins, renal veins, and then the vena cava. So vena cava, and then the renal vein, the segmental veins, the interlobar veins. I guess you couldn't see everything I wrote that. So I wrote vena cava, the arcuate veins, the cortical radiate veins. So it goes right back. So if you look here at the kidney now, what happens is, so oxygenated blood that is filled with waste enters the kidney by the renal artery, it goes into the segmental arteries up the interlobar arteries, up the arcuate arteries, out the cortical radiate arteries, and then into microscopic afferent arterioles to a glomerular capillary bed where filtration occurs. Anything that isn't going to be filtered and continue on with our story uh, then goes into the efferent arterial and then into the paratubular capillary bed where reabsorption, and that's where reabsorption occurs, and then um, the blood will return back through the cortical radiate veins, and then there's an arcuate vein, and there's interlobar veins, and segmental veins, and renal veins back to the vena cava, so it kind of runs parallel, like the vena cava would be here, and then the renal vein would be here. I just don't want our picture to get too messy, so I'm leaving off the veins.